Hello, my name is David Evans, and uh, thank you very much for joining me today for this talk, Voices in the Dark, in which I would like to look at some of the revolutionary changes brought to motion pictures uh, by the addition of sound from the mid-1920s until about 1931. I'll also uh, try to make some comment on the city of Westminster and the coming of talking pictures. In motion picture history, the sound era is uh, usually thought to start with the jazz singer in 1927, but efforts to give movies a voice go back uh, to the earliest days of what was once known as the cinematograph. In fact, silent pictures were never really silent, as large numbers of early cinemas supplied a quartet or trio of musicians, or at the very least a piano, to accompany the projection of a picture. Some larger upmarket cinemas even had full orchestras, uh, playing scores especially composed for prestige movies like uh, Ben-Hur in 1926. Now, you know, even from the earliest days, uh, moving picture pioneers such as Léon Gaumont in France, uh, Thomas Edison in the US, and, and Cecil Hepworth here in Britain had tried to synchronize gramophone records with the cinematograph, but with little success due to synchronization difficulties and uh, more importantly, those associated with the amplification of sound. By the mid-1920s, substantial efforts were being made to perfect pictures with sound on film recording devices or systems matching films with sound on electrically recorded synchronized gramophone discs. The former was supported by a lead of Forrest with, uh, via his phonofilm system which was later integrated into the Fox Film Studio's movie tone sound on film process, and the latter by Warner Brothers with its Vitaphone synchronized 16-inch diameter disc system playing at 33 and a third revolutions per minute. Initially, the, studio, the studios couldn't see any benefit in spending extra money on an industry already bringing in huge profits, and there were comments maybe sometimes apocryphal, such as, uh, who the hell wants to hear actors speak? From various quarters. But uh, one organization, Warner Brothers, did see some benefit in adding music to its productions, so that even the humblest small-town movie theater could present a film with full orchestral accompaniment. So it was decided to use the Vitaphone synchronized Sound, uh, di sound on disc system it had developed with Western Electric for a swashbuckling adventure starring the great John Barrymore, and this was Don Juan in 1926. The score was composed by William Axt and David Mendoza and was played by the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. There were also added sound effects like the clashing of swords. Now, the film premiered at the Warner Brothers Theatre on Broadway in New York on the 6th of August, 1926. Preceding it were an address from the screen by Will Hayes. Uh, he was the head of the Hayes office, set up by the motion picture industry as a sort of watchdog uh, on its activities. And some Vitaphone short films of singers and musicians performing various pieces before the camera. There was an enthusiastic response from the audience and some positive comments were made by the critics, but there was no immediate rush to embrace all this as a sensational addition to motion pictures. Warner's needed another production to consolidate its position, and this proved to be The Jazz Singer in 1927. Now, in basic terms, The Jazz Singer was just another silent picture, with synchronized songs and music, plus a few lines of spoken dialogue. But when the star Al Jolson said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet before breaking into the song Toot Toot Tootsie Goodbye, audiences went wild. The picture was a huge success, and by February 1928, it was pulling in audiences of around one million a week as more cinemas were wired for sound. And so the talkie revolution gathered pace with more studios showing interest in what looked like a profitable innovation. Warners invested heavily in the Vitaphone process, but the synchronized disc system had some important drawbacks. Uh, during filming, camera and cameraman were situated in totally unventilated, soundproofed glass booths, 
so that the primitive microphones in use could not pick up the whir of the camera. Because of this, shooting could only last for around 10 minutes before the poor camera operator expired. The camera was bolted to the floor and could just tilt or pan a few inches. More than one camera setup required additional booths and the sound technicians were also imprisoned in the same manner. And as each successful take had to be matched by a flawless recording, especially when music was provided by live musicians off camera. As sound editing was not possible, if a take was ruined, the entire roll of film had to be scrapped and the sequence refilmed or recorded from beginning to end. For those performing before the camera, the new soundless, so-called incandescent lights, made sets agonizingly hot, and if two-color technicolor was being used, the extra lighting needed for this process must have made the set as hot as Hades. During projection in the movie theater, there had to be complete synchronization between the projector and the disc, and this was sometimes hard to maintain. There was an additional problem with the latter, as the heavy pickups in use at the time meant that each disc could only be used 10 times. Later, this was improved to 20, but beyond this, music and dialogue were impossible to discern. To help counter this, a box on the record label was ticked off after each playback. However, there was always the possibility of breaking the brittle shellac records. Two, and so backup discs for this and played out records had to be provided, all adding to the expense of the, the, expense of the process. And by the way, Vitaphone discs played from the centre uh, uh, of the disc, the edge, to the middle, which is the uh, complete opposite to normal gramophone records. The system adopted by William Fox of the Fox Film Corporation, Movie Tone, avoided most of these drawbacks. By 1927, Fox had bought the entire sound on film system in new, invented by Leader Forrest and some others. He unveiled Movie Tone on the 27th of May that year in the newsreel preceding uh, the main feature, Seventh Heaven. This included pictures of uh, Lindbergh's takeoff for Paris five days earlier with sound recorded in the open air at the event. Audiences were thrilled, but the first Fox feature to incorporate movie tone called Sunrise in 1927 restricted its use to music, sound effects, and a few words of unsynchronized dialogue. Incidentally, as some of you might remember, movie tone news lasted into the 1970s. But who would win the battle for talking pictures? Studios had to contend with a completely new technology, and the fact that the actors and actresses they had under contract had to handle the new medium. Many, although they looked gorgeous on the screen, had thick regional or even uh, thick foreign accents, and the primitive microphones in use did not help in such situations. If you've seen Singing in the Rain, from 1952, often on TV, you know what I mean, where hidden microphones, often in vases or umbrella stands, but in Lena Lamont's case, she's a character in the movie, were sewed into her bosom. These failed in their job or magnified the actor's inability to understand, to be understood when speaking. Careers were balanced on a knife edge, with, with some actors adapting well to the new processes and some not at all. Stars such as the glamorous Vilma Banki, with a thick Hungarian accent, could not adapt to the microphone. And romantic dashing John Gilbert's somewhat high voice did not match the deep enthralling one cinema goers imagined he possessed as he swashbuckled his way through some very popular silent pictures. On the other hand, Ronald Coleman, who had starred with poor Vilma Banki in a number of silent successes, found that his clear, very English accent was ideal for talking pictures. The microphone loved him, and others, many of whom, made the tra easy transition from stage to pictures. Again, Singing in the Rain 1952 has some amusing moments covering this period of panic, especially when the heavily Brooklyn-accented Lena Lamont squeaks the following as her studio bosses worry about putting her in a talkie. We all talk, don't we? And her colleagues are aghast. 
Warner's released their first all-talking picture, The Lights of New York, in July 1928. It was a hit for them, grossing over $1 million against a budget of around 23000 But seen today, it proves that people would pay to see anything that moved and spoke on the screen that year. A hokey gangster pot, static acting, uh, with the classic lumbering delivery of take him for a ride, being its most memorable line. Uh, it's reported that some audiences burst into applause when Lights of New York concluded. This was probably enthusiasm for the new concept of all talking pictures, but some historian wags have interpreted this as the audience's gratitude uh, that the ordeal of watching the film was over. Warner's realized uh, or at least, sorry, their first all-talking picture, The Lights of New York, in 1928. Later, as I said already, later in September, Warner's Singing Fool with Al Jolson grossed over $5 million worldwide and featured an enormous song hit in Sonny Boy. Music was one of the talkies' main attractions, and one studio, MGM, decided to produce what is held to be the first true musical film, which established the talking picture as more than just a garish fad or a showcase for solo acts like Al Jolson's. And this really was the Broadway melody, which dates from 1929. And the backstage story starred Bessie Love and Anita Page, and it went into production in November 1928. And when it premiered on the 1st of February 1959, uh, 1929, the publicity line was that it was all talking, all singing, all dancing. But during production, some innovations were introduced. Uh, even though this was a sound on film movie, not sound on disc, the cameras were still imprisoned in their static glass booths. In order to introduce some mobility into scenes, a booth mounted on wheels was used. And although it was dubbed a coffin on wheels, by some, it was able to reintroduce some of the camera mobility of the all-silent film. Microphones were moved regularly to get the best possible effect. And it was discovered that sound editing was now possible, just as film editing was. Uh, this enabled the expensive but necessary reshooting of the big Technicolor Wedding of the Painted Doll number, production number, to be undertaken without bringing the orchestra back into the studio. The dancers and singers just performed to a playback of what had been recorded for the previous version, already with sound and picture being edited together later. And this went on to become the standard practice in the film industry. The Broadway mel melody made over $2,800,000 for MGM, multiplied by about 40 to get today's values in the US and more than one and a half million dollars overseas. Much of this, uh, much of the latter from Britain, where there was, of course, no language barrier. For one of the initial drawbacks of the talkie was that it lost the international appeal of silent pictures, where only title cards had to be changed so that the plot could be followed by audiences everywhere. To get around this, the studio started by filming productions in French, German, and Spanish to complement those in English. Charles Boyer, the great uh, French actor, for example, started his Hollywood career doing exactly this in French versions. Gradually, this top-heavy, expensive system gave way to dubbing or subtitles. And, and, and dubbing, for instance, continues to this day in French, Spanish, Italian, and German-speaking countries, and, and, and many other markets, although subtitles are still in constant use, too. The success of the Broadway melody meant that for the next couple of years, the studios churned out musical after musical, along with new mu non-musical comedies and dramas. Some of the more notable musicals are Warner's All Technicolor Gold Diggers of Broadway, On With the Show and The Show of Shows, all from 1929, MGM's Hollywood Review, 1929 and Good News 1930, Universal's Broadway in 1929, and the all-technicolor 
King of Jazz uh, in 1930, Fox's Movie Tone Follies and Sunny Side Up in 1929, and Paramount's Paramount on Parade and the All Technicolor follow through in 1930. But by late summer that year, 1930s, audiences were all musicaled out. And there was a lull until a renewed interest in musicals later in the early 1930s. One non-musical box office success of 1929 was Warner Brothers' part talkie, Noah's Ark. A two-hour-plus spectacle parale paralleling the biblical story of Noah and the flood with a tragic First World War story, all on a million-dollar budget. The shooting of the flood sequence involved over 600,000 gallons of water, the drowning of at least one extra, and injury to many others. The overture, musical score, and exit music were composed by Alois Reiser and were all played by the grandly named Vitaphone Symphony Orchestra, uh, conducted by Louis Silvers. Now, Britain, across the Atlantic, Britain, the other major but very minor by Hollywood standards source of English language pictures, had to wait until uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Blackmail in 1929 for arguably its first talkie produced by British International, International at Elstree Studios, using the RCA Photophone sound on film system. Polish Czech Annie Ondra, the star of the film, was perfect for the silent version. But for the talkie production, her accent was almost impossible to understand. Hitchcock got around this, it was the pre-dubbing period, by having her mouth all her scenes while the actress Joan Barry spoke her lines off camera. The studio involved British International Pictures publicised the film as Britain's all-talky challenge to the world, and in another campaign emphasised its use of non-Hollywood King's English with the line, see and hear it, our mother tongue as it should be spoken. Here, I'd like to sort of add a few words about uh, the city of Westminster and the coming of uh, talking pictures. Now, as the majority of the country's prestigious first-run cinemas were situated in the city of Westminster in the 1920s, the area was very much concerned with the introduction of talking pictures to the British public. Now, really, four cinemas in particular are of interest. There was the Tivoli on the Strand. This was there from 1923 until 1956. I just sort of remember it. And it's built on the site of the Tivoli Music Hall, which closed in 1914. And the Tivoli was the first UK cinema to show movies with the, re with the really audible sound system, or with a really audible sound system, when it screened some short films using the Lee de Forest sound on film phonofilm system in 1925. The public showed great interest in this, but film studios showed no interest at all. In any case, uh, by 1926, the, the Tivoli was presenting MGM's colossal epic, Ben-Hur, which played for 49 weeks well into 1927. The silent spectacle included several scenes in two-color Technicolor and was accompanied by a specially composed score played by a full orchestra in the theater. Uh, movie historians might like to note that in, 19, in 1897, what was thought to be the first film studio in Britain opened at the back of the Tivoli movie, uh, Music Hall. This was built by the British Mutoscope and Biograph Company and used natural light for filming. Now, the Piccadilly Theatre on Denman Street, which opened in 1928 and uh, is still open, this opened as a, a legitimate theater on the 27th of April 1928, but it was taken over by Warner Brothers Pictures in September 1928 and renamed the Vitaphone Theater as it was the first cinema in Britain to screen talking pictures using Warner's sound on disc Vitaphone process. The picture presented was The Jazz Singer, starring Al Jolson, and uh, he appeared on stage at the European premiere on the 27th of September 1928. Warners went on to show numerous Vitaphone productions until the theatre reverted to legitimate productions in 1930. These included pictures such as The Singing Fool and the first 100% all-talking picture, according to Warner Brothers publicity, The Lights of New York, a film, as I've 
already mentioned, whose awkwardly delivered dialogue and stilted acting tend to raise a lot of laughter today. Uh, now there's the Empire Leicester Square. Now that opened in 1928 and it's still a cinema, although rebuilt, uh, there's still a cinema there on the site today. Now this opened in 1928 under the control of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and was used to introduce British audiences to what is considered to be the first musical picture, the Broadway Melody, on the 11th of May 1929. The film was a sensation running for nine weeks with 82,000 people seeing it in the first week alone. René Clair, by 1929 already a renowned French film director, had to come to London in order to see this phenomenon, and he's on record as writing home with his delight at the picture, with the mobility of the camera at various times and uh, during the production. The Capital Cinema on, on the Haymarket uh, for, lasted from 1925 until 1936. And this was chosen for the presentation to the general public of a picture I've mentioned already, Britain's first 100% talking picture, Blackmail, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. This was on the 28th of July, 1929. Uh, by 1937, the capital had been re reconstructed as the Gaumont Haymarket, and it was itself re replaced by the now closed Odeon Haymarket in 1952. Uh, now, the coffin on wheels invented at MGM gave rise to more effort to give the sound camera something like the flexibility the camera had for all silent productions. Eventually, cameras were taken out of their booths and, although freestanding and able to move, were placed into what became known as a blimp. This was a, a soundproof casing which did the job of deadening the sound of the camera mechanism without the use of, of the clumsy and often unbearably hot glass camera booth. This still left the equally clumsy Vitaphone system with its reliance on synchronized discs which had to be replaced after being played 20 times at the projection stage and which could not be edited as the movie tone sound on move um, sound on film process could. So by late 1930 and into 1931, Warners gradually abandoned sound on disc in favor of sound on film. But the trade name Vitaphone continued to be used by them for many more years and was even incorporated into one early excursion into widescreen movies, the 65mm Vitascope, for a film called Kismet in 1931. Widescreen was a very short-lived, expensive experiment that had to wait until the early 1950s for its successful reintroduction. But the width of film used, and this was up to 70 millimeter for grand grandeur, the Fox process, meant that audiences in the few movie theaters showing this type of film were treated to much better sound than ever before. Well, by 1930, the silent pictures were as dead as a dodo, with sound becoming the norm for movies. And cinemas throughout the world were uh, are now showing talking pictures. Getting to this point had been something of a roller coaster ride for some who couldn't adapt and for others who could. The former just faded away but the latter embraced the changes, all this brought with enthusiasm. No longer was the medium of fil film a mere shadow play. As with a voice, it went from strength to strength and still does to this day. Many thanks for listening to me today. Thank you.